The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. In this lecture today, I'm going to introduce you to an American painter, Charles Wilson Peel. You may be familiar with his portraits. But did you know that he never even saw a painting till he was a grown man? He was born in Maryland in 1741. His father died when he was nine, and the family struggled financially for the next few years, and Charles became a saddle maker's apprentice. One day he went to Norfolk for supplies, and there he saw paintings for the first time. He thought they were so bad that he felt sure he could do better, so he decided to make painting his career. In 1766, he went to London to study painting with Benjamin West. Whilst there, he painted this portrait in 1768, see slide 1, Pitt as a Roman senator. Notice how elaborately symbolical this portrait is. The symbolism arises, of course, from Pitt's famous speech to the British Parliament, where he draws an analogy between the ancient Roman Senate's view of a barbaric Briton and the prevailing European view of the time of a barbaric African continent fueling the slavery trade. Perhaps you didn't know that the Romans used Britons as slaves. But I digress. Back to Peel. He returned to America and in 1772 painted the first ever portrait of George Washington. See slide 2. In 1773, he painted a group portrait of himself, his wife, mother, brothers, sister, his old nurse, and an unidentified baby. Just look at the slide. This painting is simply called The Peel Family and you can almost feel the exuberance of the family and their warmth towards one another. He enjoyed great success as a portraitist prior to the Revolution, and served with distinction in the Revolution. During this time, he became friends with George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. After the war, he continued to paint, and, when his wife died in the 1790s, as a result of her eleventh pregnancy, he remarried. He had seventeen children in all, naming the sons after famous painters or scientists. Although perhaps best known for his portraits of famous people, Peel liked novelty. Look at this slide of his two sons, Raphael and Titian, life-size, climbing a narrow stairway. This painting, The Staircase Group, 1795, was exhibited in a doorway as a trompe l'oeil, and it is said that it did, in fact, fool the eye of George Washington. Even as far back as 1772, we can see his desire for difference in Rachel weeping. It's a rather macabre portrait of his first wife crying over the death of one of their children, their daughter Margaret. I'd like to show you one more slide to demonstrate his innovative approach. This is a portrait of his brother, James, sitting at his desk at night, 
with only his face illuminated by a lamp. This was painted much later than the others, in 1822. You know, Peel believed anyone could learn to paint, and he taught painting to his brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, and other relatives. Four of his sons, Titian, Rubens, Rembrandt, and Raphael, became painters, as did his brother James. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Before I finish, I'd like to tell you a bit more about Peel. He was active in politics for several years, and throughout his life he maintained a lively interest in many branches of science. He was also an inventor who gained patents for a fireplace, porcelain false teeth, and a new kind of wooden bridge. He collaborated with Thomas Jefferson on what was known as the polygraph, a kind of portable writing desk. But it wasn't any ordinary desk. This one could make several copies of a manuscript at once. He also wrote papers on a wide variety of subjects, from hygiene to engineering. Oh, and he also tried his hand at inventing a fairly primitive but innovative motion picture technique new types of eyeglasses, and a velocipede, which is a precursor to the bicycle. Now, some of the original velocipedes had pedals and some didn't. You sort of scooted along on them using your feet. Unfortunately, I can't remember which type it was that Peel worked on. He's also remembered for his work as a naturalist. He established the first scientific museum in America and he even invented his own system of taxidermy. For those of you who aren't sure what taxidermy is, it's the art of preparing, stuffing, and presenting dead animals so that they appear lifelike. He was also well ahead of his time in that he placed his animals in a simulated natural environment. His most magnificent exhibit, however, was the complete skeleton of an extinct mammal known as a mastodon, which he helped excavate. The event was memorialized in his extraordinary painting, The Exhuming of the Mastodon. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2 First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to this lecture on agriculture and the environment. I hope it is enough to make some of you decide on a career in the field of agricultural science. 
As you all know, food is a basic human need, and producing enough of it is the single greatest challenge facing the modern world. Developing nations have rapidly expanding populations, so agriculture should be central to any development agenda for those countries. What's more, 75% of people in the developing world are dependent, directly or indirectly, on agriculture for their livelihood. And for many low-income countries, it's the most important sector of the economy, accounting for 50% of GDP, and sometimes it's the primary, if not only, source of foreign currency. Now, of course, when I talk about agriculture, I am using the term to encompass more than just growing food crops. Of course, livestock farming, fishing, and forestry are included. In order to combat wide-scale food shortages, agricultural research programs are underway in many areas. Using science is one way to increase productivity. But a word of warning, agriculture must also be sustainable. Let's look at approaches that are not sustainable. Firstly, overgrazing and intensive cropping are two ancient but destructive practices that lead to loss of soil fertility. Secondly, the modern idea of liberal application of chemical pesticides and herbicides has had disastrous consequences for the health of the land, ranging from the pollution of water sources to the destruction of wildlife. These practices have ignored the mechanisms that sustain ecological communities. Ignorance has led to the destruction of the very biodiversity that is essential for sustainable food production. However, introducing new agricultural techniques, especially things like genetic engineering, can be difficult because many people remain suspicious of the fact that plants have had their genetic material modified by scientists. Biotechnology has also led to the dubious practice of bioprospecting or, as some prefer to call it, biopiracy. Foreign multinational companies have been accused of illegally obtaining samples of indigenous plants of other countries in order to get their hands on genetic material to improve the quality or yield of their own crops. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. We must put aside the controversy surrounding the field of agricultural biotechnology in order to concentrate on the biggest threat to food production on this planet, which is, yes, climate change. The effects of global warming so far have been to shrink the food supply, thereby pushing up prices and making even the most basic necessities, unaffordable. As I see it, the international community must address this and other challenges to agricultural production with urgency. Concrete scientific and technological achievements need to be presented for farmers to evaluate and learn to use. But, apart from that, governments need to address the complex issues of policy development if the world's hungry are to be fed. Environmental policies need to be put in place to protect ecosystems and correct soil degradation where possible. Countries cannot continue to exploit natural resources whilst ignoring the consequences. In fact, I'd like to see teams of agriculture and environment experts making up a global network which would monitor the world's farming systems. Different farming systems should be studied not only with a view to analyzing the environmental effects, but the social and economic effects as well. The studies would be carried out 
with a view to stemming pollution and erosion and promoting safe, cost-effective practices that will guarantee a secure food supply in the future. Monitoring sites would need to be set up all across the world and data collected in a systematic way. Of course, building the online infrastructure for such a project would cost millions of dollars, and there would be ongoing costs involved with the monitoring system. But the information gathered would go a long way towards solving the problem of feeding the masses and ensuring millions of people don't face a hungry future. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3 First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 23. Good morning, everyone. In these environmental science lectures, I guess you're all used to hearing about global warming. Well, I'm here today to talk to you about one particular volcano and its effect of global cooling. I'll begin by going back a little bit in time. Towards the middle of 1991, the second largest volcanic eruption of the last century occurred in the Philippines, not far from the capital city, Manila, on the island of Luzon. Mount Pinatubo belongs to a chain of volcanoes in the area, and this was by no means its first eruption. There is evidence of eruptions from approximately 500, 3,000 and 5,500 years ago. The events of the 1991 Mount Pinatubo eruption began in July 1990, when a magnitude 7.8 earthquake occurred 100 kilometers northeast of the Pinatubo region. The sleeping giant was reawakened, but few people had any idea of what was in store for them. In mid-March 1991, many earthquakes were experienced around Mount Pinatubo, and this is when volcano scientists or volcanologists as they are called, started their investigation of the mountain. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 24 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 24 to 30. Before the disaster, thousands of people lived in very close proximity to the mountain, and on April 2nd, small explosions from vents near the crater dusted their villages with ash. This resulted in the order for evacuations of 5,000 people later that month. Earthquakes and explosions continued to harass the residents, and on June 5th, a Level 3 alert was issued for two weeks because of the possibility of a major eruption. However, 
the appearance of a large amount of lava protruding from the mountain on July 7th led to the announcement of a level 5 alert on June 9th, indicating an eruption in progress. An evacuation area within 20 kilometers of the volcano was established, and this time 25,000 people were evacuated. On the following day, Clark Air Base was evacuated, and the danger radius was extended to 30 kilometers from the volcano, resulting in the total evacuation of 58,000 people. On June 15th, just after midday, the eruption of Mount Pinatubo commenced and lasted nine hours, causing numerous major earthquakes due to the collapse of the land at the top of the mountain and the creation of a huge caldera. What's a caldera, I hear you say? Well, it's obvious, really. With a huge eruption such as this, where enormous amounts of material have exploded into the air, the summit falls into what is now an empty chamber and thus forms a large crater. As luck would have it, as the eruption was taking place, a tropical storm was passing just to the northeast of Mount Pinatubo, bringing a lot of rainfall to the area. The dust and cinders that had been thrown up into the atmosphere combined with the water vapor from the storm to cause a rainfall of tephra that fell across the whole island of Luzon. Most of the people who perished during the eruption did so because of the weight of the ash collapsing roofs and killing the occupants of the houses. If it hadn't been for that passing storm, the death toll would certainly have been much lower. But that's not all. Besides the ash, Mount Pinatubo expelled between 15 and 30 million tons of sulfur dioxide gas. Can you guess what happened next? Yes, the sulfur dioxide mixed with water and oxygen in the atmosphere to become sulfuric acid, which is a major contributor to ozone reduction. The eruption plume from Mount Pinatubo reached high into the atmosphere, attaining an altitude of 34 kilometers, and the resulting aerosol cloud spread around the Earth in two weeks and had covered the planet within a year. During the years 1992 and 1993, the ozone hole situated over Antarctica reached an unprecedented size. The cooling effects of this cloud over the Earth were remarkable. It reduced global temperatures considerably. In the United States, for example, we experienced our third coldest and third wettest summer in 77 years during 1992. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4 First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to our series on renewable resources. The topic today is hydropower. As you most probably know, 
hydro means water, so we are talking about using water to generate electricity. Of course, there are many ways to generate electricity, but hydropower is important to the community. Firstly and obviously because it's renewable. The Earth's hydrologic cycle of constant evaporation and transpiration provides a continual supply of water from rainfall and snowmelt. The second point to consider is its efficiency. Hydropower plants are able to convert approximately 90% of the energy from the falling water into electric energy, whereas many fossil fueled plants lose more than half of the energy content of their fuel by way of waste heat and gases. For this reason, they are very efficient. Hydropower is also clean. It doesn't emit harmful gases that contribute to air pollution, acid rain, and global warming. No trucks, trains, or pipelines are needed to bring fuel to the site, and there's no noise pollution either. Furthermore, hydropower plant machinery is fairly simple and runs at slow speeds, which makes it reliable and durable. And hydropower units are flexible also. They have the ability to start quickly and adjust rapidly to changes in demand for electricity, thus enabling them to meet peak loads. But this also allows them to serve as reserve capacity and bring more stability to the power system overall. The dams that provide hydroelectric power also have other uses. Such as navigation, flood damage reduction, water supply, recreation, irrigation, and low flow augmentation. But it's not the purpose of this talk to go into those details. How do the hydropower plants work? Well, a dam is built across a river, which captures water to form a reservoir and raises the water level to create head. Think of head as the vertical distance that the water falls. As it passes through the dam, in other words, the difference in water level between the reservoir behind the dam and the river below. Water from the reservoir flows through an intake gate into a penstock. This is a kind of narrow channel which leads to the turbine below. The force of the water causes the turbine to rotate rapidly, which in turn drives the generator to spin and produce electricity. The electricity is carried the long distances from the powerhouse to substations on the outskirts of cities via power lines. Can you build a hydropower unit on any river? Well, no. Just having water in a river isn't enough. A good dam site must have enough stream flow as well as enough head. A fast-flowing river on the plains is probably not suitable because a dam couldn't be built high enough. To provide the head needed for efficient production of electricity. On the other hand, dams in arid high country may have plenty of head but insufficient stream flow. The perfect spot for a hydropower plant is where the right combination of stream flow and head exists. What about the environment? Surely the construction of large dams has an environmental impact. Well, yes, it does. Certainly, dams and reservoirs are built to improve the lives of people living in towns, farming communities, and cities. But there must be a balance between development and preserving the natural environment. Needless to say, the natural river environment is changed, which leads to changes in river ecology and aquatic habitat. Sometimes, for example, dissolved oxygen levels below dams get so low in summer. That there is a negative impact on aquatic life. These levels can be improved, however, by using special aerating turbines and/or injecting oxygen directly into the stream flow. In order to protect and improve the habitat for endangered and other species of birds, fish, and water life, there needs to be a thorough review of operating plans to see if a better balance can be achieved. Hydropower plant design and operation. Must not only meet the needs of consumers for electricity, but work hand in hand with agencies whose concern is for the fish and wildlife, water quality, and water supply. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.